Chapter 6 Doris woke well before dawn and sewed by the light of a lantern. She worked as quickly as she could, getting the dress done just in time to start breakfast for her new family. She quickly made scrambled eggs and toast from the bread she'd baked the day before, then went to wake the girls. They had done really well with their training the day before, but she'd put them in diapers to sleep. She dressed them in the dresses she'd made while they slept, and then covered them in towels to eat their breakfast. Harvey came downstairs with the boys, just as she was getting the girls seated at the table. I didn't hear you get up this morning. I got up really early to finish Pauline's dress. He grinned at her. You got them both done? He believed she'd set herself an impossible task, but he hadn't wanted to discourage her by saying so. I'm really impressed. She smiled, scooping eggs onto each plate. She set food in front of each of the children before getting plates for herself and Harvey. I'm tired, but the girls will look beautiful for church. They sure will. I can't wait to see them after breakfast. After the prayer, Doris looked over at the boys, who had sullen looks on their faces. Is something wrong, boys? You made the girls new clothes. What about us? Matthew asked. I'll be making you new clothes as soon as I can. I had to get the girls something that fit before church this morning. You can wear your brother's old clothes for a little while at least. They had nothing. Do you like them better than us? Bobby asked, his face sad. Not at all. I love you all equally, just like a mother should. I made a list yesterday of everything I have to do to get the house and your clothes shipshape. Doris got up and walked over to the work table where she'd left the list. I put numbers by the things that needed to be done first, second, third, and so on. See? She handed Bobby the list where number one was getting the girls' dresses and number two was close for the boys. Bobby looked down at it and frowned. So we're next? You are most definitely next. I'll make clothes for you boys, and then I'll make something else for the girls. She leaned forward, as if to impart a great secret. Want to know a secret? Bobby nodded. What? I'll be making clothes for you four children, before I make anything for your papa. He comes last. Matthew giggled, covering his mouth with his hand. We're more important than papa? Absolutely. She grinned over at Harvey, seeing that he approved of her explanation for the boys. I'll start on clothes for you boys right after church today. Matthew's face fell. It's church day? Harvey shook his head at Matthew. You know it's Sunday. Just keep on smiling, son. Why don't you like church? Doris asked, surprised. She'd always loved going to church and seeing the other children there. Matthew just shrugged, looking down at his plate. Bobby pushed his food away, mostly uneaten. People don't like us there. They call us the butler brats. My brothers and sisters, and I had bad names too. The women at church thought they were clever making up names to call us, but the names are hurtful, aren't they? She hoped she could explain to the kids in a way they'd understand how she'd been treated when she was young. Of course, she and her siblings had deserved the names and done their best to live down to them. Yes, Bobby nodded emphatically. We're not brats. No, I really don't think you are. I think you acted out a few times and made people think you were brats. Do you want to know how to confuse people like that? How? She lowered her voice, though she knew Harvey was listening. She thought the boys would like it better if they thought she was imparting some great, secret wisdom. Go to church today and act perfectly. Sit with your hands on your laps. Don't squirm. Don't throw anything. Don't tear off the numbers at the top of the pages in the hymnal so people can't find their songs. How did you? Matthew stared at her as if she were some sort of magician, able to read their minds. How did I know you did that? Because my brothers and sisters did the same thing. 
We'd moved to a new location in church every week so we could make sure none of the hymns had any numbers, and everyone was confused. She sat back and shrugged. Trust me, there's no mischief you've ever thought of that I haven't already done. Harvey sat quietly watching his new wife with his children. She connected with them better than he'd imagined anyone could. It was as if she spoke their language. Isn't it sad that all the tricks you've played have already been done? Bobby looked at Doris with wonder in his eyes. Could you help us with a prank then? Doris threw back her head and laughed. I'm out of the prank business, and in the mother business instead. I think we can figure out other fun stuff to do. Don't you? Bobby shrugged. I guess. Having a mom who pranks with me would make me the envy of all my friends, though. I'm sure it would. Finish your breakfast so we can go to church and confuse everyone. Matthew shrugged, taking a bite of his eggs. He was obviously game. As soon as breakfast was finished, Doris untied the towels from around the girls. Harvey looked at them and shook his head. You girls look beautiful. You can't be my girls, can you? Pre giggled. It's really us, Papa. Pauline nodded emphatically, agreeing with her sister. He got down on his knees on the floor, enveloping both girls in a hug. You know you're always my favorite girls, right? They nodded emphatically, their braids bobbing up and down. Doris turned away to do the dishes, more so her family didn't see the tears in her eyes, then, because the dishes needed to be done. When they walked into church as a family for the first time, Doris had one hand held by Pri and the other resting on her husband's arm. The boys were wearing clothes a little tighter than she'd like, but at least their pants were long enough. By next Sunday, all of the children would be wearing clothes that fit properly. Harvey started to go into a pew at the very back of the church, but Doris shook her head. She moved instead to a pew in the middle, confident that the children would want to behave, if only to confuse the people who had called them names for so long. The children stayed with her and Harvey as people came over and introduced themselves. The church was small, but Doris had time to meet six or seven ladies before the pastor cleared his throat to start the service. Let's open our hymnals to hymn number 23. Doris reached for the hymnal in front of her and flipped a couple of pages, seeing that she had guessed right. There were no page numbers in the hymnals in that pew or any others it seemed. Gradually, everyone began singing along with the pastor's loud baritone voice. After the prayer, the pastor greeted everyone. I want to extend a warm welcome to Mrs. Doris Butler. She married Harvey Butler this week, and she's moved here from Massachusetts. I hope you'll all find time to greet her. People turned and looked at her, and Doris saw many women whispering to their husbands. She refused to let it bother her. She knew they were all talking about the mistake she'd made in marrying Harve. She'd show them all she was made of stronger stuff than they thought. After church, there was a young woman who walked over to her and introduced herself. She was obviously in the advanced stages of pregnancy. The people here are good people. They just like to talk, and they don't think much of your boys. Dora shrugged. I can tell. We'll change their minds. The woman grinned, her whole face lighting up. I'm Gretchen Linden. It's nice to meet you. It's good to meet you too. Doris felt deep down that this woman was meant to be her friend. What are you due? Another two months. Gretchen patted her belly. I'm looking forward to the day. My man died right before we were supposed to get married, so everyone keeps looking down their noses at me. You probably don't want to talk to me if you want others to like you. None of them do. Doris shrugged. I'm not without sin, so I can't cast stones. I think you and I are meant to be friends. She looked around and saw many of the older women whispering behind their hands again. Would you like to come over for tea tomorrow? I'm going to need a break from sewing by early afternoon. I would be happy to come and help you sew, if that would make you happy. Doris nodded. 
That would help me a lot. Is there nowhere you need to be? Gretchen shrugged. I live with my parents, but they're ashamed of me, and if I can get away from another lecture about how I'm going to burn in hell for my sins, I'm willing to do that. All right. Come as early as you want, then. Any time after eight is fine. I'll be working on making clothes for the boys around housework and baking all day. And watching the twins, of course. I'll see you at eight, then. Thank you so much for the invitation. Seems to me we both need friends right now. We do. Gretchen walked away with a smile on her face, and Doris was glad she'd invited the other woman over. Maybe no one else in town thought much of either of them, but that was no reason they couldn't like each other. Doris walked back to Harvey's side. I invited Gretchen to spend the day with me tomorrow. Harvey nodded, smiling at her. I think that's a good thing. She needs a good friend. Asterisk. Harvey left her with a kiss that had her toes curling the next morning. He had agreed to wait to consummate their marriage, but he wouldn't wait to kiss her and touch her. He said those were his rights, and he wasn't giving them up. She fixed a lunch for the boys to share and put it in their lunch pail. As she handed the pail to Bobby, she said, Remember. You can live up to others' expectations of you, or you can rise above, and show them that you're not who they think you are. Either way, your father and I will love you. She kissed each of them on the cheek and sent them off to school. She wasn't worried about them misbehaving in class, because she knew she'd done worse than anything they could think up. After watching them leave, she turned her attention to the dishes. The twins sat at the table with paper and pencils, scribbling away, while she did her morning chores. She glanced at the clock and saw that it was ten minutes after eight. Where was Gretchen? As she finished the last dish, there was a knock on her door, and she rushed over to answer it. Oh, I'm so glad you made it. I was getting worried. My mother stopped me on the way out. She told me that you didn't really want me to come over but you felt like you needed to pity me. And then she said that what you really wanted was to steal my baby. Gretchen shook her head. I was glad to get out of there. Doris rolled her eyes. I promise you, there was no other reason I invited you than companionship. I need friends, and I think you'll be a good one. So I had you come over. Seemed like a smart thing to do to me. So what can I do? Dora sighed. There's so much to do, I can't even express it all. Would you be willing to work on pants for one of the boys while I bake some bread? Of course. Gretchen settled into one of the chairs at the table and picked up the pieces of pants that Doris had already cut out. Doris gave each of the girls some of the dough from the bread. Can you make a face out of it? The twins giggled and played with the dough while Doris and Gretchen chatted about the people in town. So far, most people seem to really hate the boys, Doris said with a frown. I've never seen anyone hate children so much. Even the people in our old town didn't have quite that much antipathy toward my siblings and me. Of course, we deserved it a lot more than the boys did. Gretchen shrugged. It's the way they are, but I'm not sure why. I remember when their mother died. Everyone was here every day to help. Mothers brought their daughters to talk to your husband. I think they were trying to marry him off right away. When he refused, people got angry with him. And that seemed to make things worse for the boys. I can see that. And no one seems to be exactly pleased with me. They all tell me they'll pray for me. If one more person tells me they'll pray for me, well, I don't know what I'll do, but it will be bad. Gretchen laughed. What a threat. I'm sure all of the townswomen are shaking in their perfectly shined boots. Doris turned from the bread she was kneading. What is with everyone having to be perfect here? I've never been perfect a day in my life and don't intend to pretend to be perfect. They just need to realize that people are imperfect and have human frailties. I really don't know. 
I just know that my mother is mortified that I brought shame on her by getting pregnant when I'm not married. I'm surprised she's even letting me continue to live in her house. Gretchen shook her head. I love my baby. I loved his father. I don't care what they say. How did he die? He was a fisherman, and he went out to sea one day and never returned. The water was choppy, and it was stormy. We can only presume he died at sea. Doris frowned. That's sad. Well, if you need a friend who will celebrate the life of your baby with you, that friend is me. It's going to be tough to raise a child on your own, but I know you can do it. Gretchen smiled, looking at the twins. I know I can too. For Reginald, I'll do anything. Dora sighed, wishing she had those feelings of love for her husband. She certainly wanted to. Chapter 7 By the time the children came home from school, new pants had been made for both of the boys. Gretchen sat and worked diligently all day while Doris took care of the twins, baked, cooked, and cleaned. While the twins napped, Doris sat down to help sew, and the two ladies got to know one another better. Bobby came in from school with a note from the teacher that he gave to Doris. She accepted it with a bit of trepidation, but as she opened it, she reminded herself that the boys couldn't have done anything worse than she'd done with her siblings. Why that helped her stay calm, she didn't know. But it did help. Dear Mrs. Butler, I would like to meet with you at your earliest convenience concerning the behavior of Robert and Matthew. I want the two of us to work together to ensure a better school year than we had last year. I almost didn't return to teach this year due to their shenanigans. May I come by after school on Wednesday to discuss this matter with you? I await your response. Miss Hughes. Doris took a deep breath before going to fetch a pencil and a piece of paper. She quickly wrote out a response and set it on the table to be put into the boys' lunch pail for them to take back to Miss Hughes. Dear Miss Hughes, Thank you for the note. I would love to work with you to ensure the boys have a good school year. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I will have a light snack ready when you arrive, and if you'd like, We'd love to have you for supper on Wednesday night as well. Then you would have the opportunity to talk to both my husband and me. I will plan on you for supper unless I hear otherwise. Sincerely, Mrs. Butler. It felt odd to Doris to sign the new name, but she presumed every woman felt that way so soon after a marriage. As soon as she was finished, she said, Are you boys hungry for a snack? Your father won't be home for another couple of hours, so I made some cookies for you. Bobby looked at her with a perplexed expression. You're not mad? Now why would I be angry? Did you do something I don't know about? No, ma'am. I just thought you'd be angry that the teacher wanted to speak with you. Doris grinned. Want to know a secret? Bobby nodded, his eyes wide. My mother was sent a letter just like that at the beginning of every school year. Of course, we'd usually already done something that the teacher needed to discuss with our mother, and no one ever came back to teach us for a second semester. Many teachers wouldn't even finish out their first semester with us. We were loud and obnoxious. Gretchen watched the whole thing with her head bowed, seeming to concentrate on the work in front of her. She said nothing, but Doris could see her hiding a grin. Bobby studied his new stepmother for another moment, but then he sat down at the table. I'll take those cookies now. Doris grinned as Matthew sat down beside his brother. Cookies for two. Tea or milk, she asked. Matthew tilted his head to one side, as if considering the question. I would like milk, please. Bobby? Doris asked. Milk. She got cookies for all four of them and milk for the boys and tea for her and Gretchen. How was school today? Doris asked as soon as she was sitting down. Gretchen set her sewing aside and took a bite of one of the cookies, watching the boys to see what their answer would be. Bobby shrugged. It was a good day, I think. We didn't pull any pranks at all. 
We just did our work like we were supposed to. Dora smiled. I'm proud of you for not pulling any pranks. Just for that, I'll let you decide what you want to eat for supper tomorrow night. Can you boys decide on something that sounds good to you? The boys looked at each other with surprise. They hadn't expected any sort of kindness just for not getting into trouble. They leaned toward each other and whispered back and forth for a moment. Fried chicken and mashed potatoes, Bobby finally announced. That sounds delicious. Gretchen said. I love fried chicken. Doris looked at her new sons. What do you boys think? Should we invite Miss Gretchen to eat with us? Bobby shrugged. I don't care if she eats here. Me neither, Matthew answered. Good. That's settled then. She stuffed the last of her cookie into her mouth and reached over for the first pair of pants that had been made. Look what Miss Gretchen finished. Bobby looked at them. For me? Doris nodded. And? She held up the other pair. Matthew grinned. You do like us as much as the twins. She laughed. Of course, I do. I'm going to try to get new shirts made for you tomorrow, but I might not quite make it. Shirts are harder, and there will only be one of me sewing. I had a lot of help today. Bobby looked at Gretchen. Thank you for helping. Matthew nodded. Thank you. Gretchen looked at Doris. I can come back tomorrow. I have nothing else to do with my days. My mother does the housework and doesn't let me touch anything for fear I'll do it wrong. I've done all the sewing the baby will need. Until I actually have this little person in my arms, I've got nothing else to do. Doris bit her lip. I could use the help, but I would have to talk to Harvey about paying you for your time. I couldn't let you continue to work for nothing. Gretchen shook her head adamantly. No pay. I need a place to go, and you're providing one for me. Please. We'll talk about it tomorrow when there are no little ears listening. She wasn't about to discuss financial matters in front of the children. Her parents never had, and she felt it was a good practice. I won't be able to come back if you insist on paying me. Gretchen took a sip of her tea and watched Doris over the top of it, gauging her friend's reaction. Doris frowned. We'll discuss it later. She turned back to the boys. Do you have schoolwork to do this evening? Bobby shook his head. No, ma'am. Then after you finish your snack, you may go outside and play. Pa never lets us play outside by ourselves, Matthew said. Doris didn't like that rule, but she also didn't want to contradict her husband. Then you both play in front of the house where I can see you. I'll talk to your father tonight, and we'll come up with a hard and fast rule. The boys exchanged a look before nodding at the same time. As soon as the boys were out of the house, Doris turned to her friend. I'm going to start supper and then check on the girls. Would you mind starting one of the shirts? I measured them both yesterday and cut out shirts for them. I'd be happy to. When do you need to be home? Doris asked. She had a feeling her friend had to answer to her parents for her whereabouts. By supper time. I'll let them know that I'm eating here Wednesday, though. Gretchen picked up the pieces of white linen and carefully started basting two of them together. I think you're the best thing that could have possibly happened to the Butler family. And to me. Doris smiled. I'm happy to already have a friend here. She stood up and cleared the table of the snacks. I'm going to run a few cookies and some milk out to Harvey. She'd taken him lunch at lunchtime as well. She had no idea who had fed him for the past few years, but it was her job to do so now. When she approached her husband with the jar of milk and a plate of cookies, he picked up a bandana and wiped his brow. You're spoiling me. He set down the log he'd been working on and sat down. To what do I owe this surprise? She sat beside him, handing him the cookies and milk. I needed to talk to you for a moment, 
and I thought you might be a bit hungry. He shrugged. I work hard. I'm always hungry. What do you need to talk to me about? He took one of the offered cookies and the milk. Tilting his head back, he took a swig of the liquid, his Adam's apple bobbing as he drank. Gretchen has offered to come over every day to help me with sewing until her baby arrives. I would love the help, but I also think we need to pay her for her time. She says no. Can you pay her in meals? And maybe make her a gift for the baby? Doris nodded, smiling. I could make her a baby quilt for the winter. And I will feed her every meal while she's here. Problem solved. Next, the boys informed me they aren't allowed to play outside. I told them they could play as long as they were within plain sight of the kitchen window, so I may watch them. He seemed to contemplate for a moment. I think that's a good solution. They could also play where I could see them, but I'd rather not have to worry about them. He loved that she was thinking of ways to give the boys more freedom, while still keeping them safe and out of trouble. No, that's my responsibility. Third, the boy's teacher sent a note home, asking if she may come over after work on Wednesday. I invited her to stay for supper. She wants to make sure there are no problems this school year. Nothing happened today? He looked skeptical. The boys say no, and she didn't mention any trouble in her note. She only wanted to talk to me, but I thought if she stayed for supper, you could be party to any decisions made. She didn't know if he trusted her to talk to the teacher alone or would want to be part of things. Either way, she was happy to do all she could. He shrugged. You're welcome to make all the decisions about their schooling. As their mother, that's your job. I don't mind if she stays for supper, but I don't feel the need to be part of any decisions. All right then. She stood up and dusted off the back of her dress. There was sawdust everywhere. I'll go in and start supper. He caught her hand before she could walk away and pulled her to him. How about kissing your husband before you head back to the house? She blushed. In the middle of the street? Not that it mattered. She wasn't there to please anyone but him and his children. Everyone knows we're married. Kissing me isn't going to tell them we're doing anything wrong. She willingly went to him, stood on tiptoe, and brushed her lips against his. There. Happy now? He laughed. Happy as can be. Quit distracting me and let me get back to work, woman. She made a face as she hurried around the sawmill to the house. Gretchen was sitting where she'd left her, still basting the shirt. I talked to Harv, and he said you may come every day and help, but you have to let me feed you. Gretchen shrugged. I think that's fair. Good. She quickly put a pork roast into a pan and peeled some potatoes and carrots before stuffing it into the oven. I'm going to check on the twins. She walked into the room where they were playing together silently. It was almost eerie how well they played together, with no words spoken between them but she'd been told she and Daryl had been just the same when they'd been small. They were both dry, and she praised them before taking them to the water closet. Training them was easier than she'd expected, but they were older than most children trained as well. She sat them both in chairs with cookies and milk while she worked on basting the other shirt. While they worked, she and Gretchen talked about Gretchen's love. What was his name? Reginald. We've loved one another since our first day of school. I always knew I'd grow up and marry him, and we'd have children together. I know I should be ashamed of the baby I'm carrying, but I can't be, because I have something left of him. How do his parents feel about it? Gretchen shrugged. They blame my parents and call me a loose woman, said that if it wasn't for me, their son would have been perfect. Doris sighed. Of course, he would have been. Because perfect men are everywhere. She knew sarcasm wasn't polite, but how could she help herself? I know. I don't know if they'll have anything to do with the baby after it's born, but if they don't, it will be their loss. 
I'm going to love my child because it's the last part of the man I love that I have left. I know what we did wasn't right, but it was done in love. You don't have to explain yourself to me, Gretchen. I don't judge. I'm just glad I have a friend here. And if you need help with the baby, know that I'm your friend as well. Gretchen smiled. Thank you. Before Gretchen left, the shirts had been basted together, and all that was left was to sew them up, add the buttons and buttonholes, and hem them. Doris was thrilled with how much their two sets of hands had been able to accomplish. She wished she had a solution for her friend, but there was none. Maybe she could have Elizabeth help her find a groom for Gretchen. After the children were in bed that evening, Doris and Harvey sat in the parlor together. You've done a wonderful job with the house, Harvey told her. I had no idea it could look this good in such a short amount of time. I want to do a great deal more, but I couldn't have done all I have without Gretchen. Her friendship is going to be a godsend. Doris only hoped she could be as helpful to her friend when the baby came along. I'm glad. I know she needed a friend as much as you did. Working together will be good for both of you. Thank you for not minding that I befriended an unwed mother. I know everyone in town is judging her for what happened between her and Reginald, but I don't feel like I have any right to throw stones. I'm far from perfect. He took her hand and brought it to his lips. You're very close to perfect in my eyes. You've come here, made my children your own, spruced up my house, made friends with the friendless, I could go on for a while. I didn't have high expectations for the bride that was coming, but you are a special woman, Doris Butler. She scooted closer to him on the sofa. I think you're awfully special yourself. The children are doing remarkably well for having no mother. He shook his head. Not the boys. They've been hellions but they have good hearts. You can see it in their manners and the way they respond when given instruction. I can't complain about that at all. You see the best in everyone. She shrugged. I guess it's my gift. He laughed, drawing her to him for a kiss. He needed to remember to thank Mrs. Johnson for sticking her nose where it didn't belong. He may not love this woman beside him, but he knew it was only a matter of time. For now, the way she treated him and his children was more than enough. Chapter 8 When the teacher came over Wednesday after school, Doris had cookies and tea waiting. She welcomed the woman with a smile. You must be Miss Hughes. I'm Doris Butler. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Miss Hughes looked to be around 30. She had dark hair pulled back into a tight bun and a pair of glasses perched on the edge of her nose. To Doris, she looked like a caricature of a schoolteacher. Please sit down. I hope you don't mind that my friend, Gretchen, is here. She's helping me catch up on my sewing. Miss Hughes sat at the table and smiled a tight smile at Gretchen. If you don't mind her being party to our discussion, I certainly don't mind her being here. Thank you. Would you like some tea and cookies? That would be very nice, thank you. Miss Hughes had her hands folded properly in her lap, and she glanced out the window to see the boys playing catch with a baseball outside. The boys seemed different since you arrived, Mrs. Butler. Please, call me Doris. I can't get used to my new last name, and I may forget to answer. Miss Hughes smiled. All right. She took a bite of one of the cookies placed in front of her and smiled. These are wonderful. Thank you. I enjoy baking very much. Doris put cookies and tea in front of Gretchen, knowing her friend would enjoy them. So, let's talk about the boys. Have you experienced any bad behavior this year? Miss Hughes shook her head. No, I haven't, and frankly, that frightens me. Last year, when there was a short period of them being well-behaved, it was because they were planning the biggest prank of the entire school year. Oh, really? Doris refused to be swayed by past behavior. She was worried about how the boys behaved now and in the future. 
Yes. They, well, I suppose their past exploits are not of concern to you, are they? Miss Hughes smiled tightly. I hope you'll partner with me this year. If I have to punish them at school, I'd like to know that you will punish them at home as well. My husband and I don't believe in corporal punishment. But I promise you, if they misbehave at school, there will be repercussions at home as well. Doris had no idea what she'd do if the boys misbehaved, but she'd think of something when the time came. She was very creative, after all. It was one of her skills. That would be fine. I believe there is a place for corporal punishment, as most teachers do, but I will not criticize you for your views on child-rearing. I do think having you here as an influence has calmed the children down. I may be wasting both of our time by coming so early in the year, but I needed to talk to you for my own peace of mind. I understand. I'm afraid my brothers and sisters and I were much worse behaved than the boys could ever dream of being. Our teachers had many meetings with our parents, to no avail. We never had a teacher come back for a second semester. I don't want to say the same thing of my boys. Miss Hughes took a sip of her tea. I suppose you know how to spot it when the boys are planning mischief, then. Doris grinned. There's no one more qualified to spot a great plan, I'm afraid. I think we'll do well together then. Are you staying for supper? Doris asked. She wasn't sure if she wanted the other woman to or not. Miss Hughes was a little too uptight for her tastes. I would like that very much. Do you know in my year here in Salmon, this is the first dinner invitation I've received? It's nice to be able to spend time with other ladies. Then I'm very pleased you'll be joining us. Doris looked toward the stairs. I can hear the twins upstairs. I need to go and get them from their nap and give them their afternoon snack. Please excuse me for a moment. With that, she left the two ladies together to chat. Five minutes later, she came back to the kitchen holding the girls' hands in hers. Pre, Pauline, this is Miss Hughes. She's your brother's teacher. Pre, always the more outgoing of the two, smiled. They don't like school. Miss Hughes smiled at that, her first smile that seemed completely genuine to Doris. Is that so? I felt that may be the case. Pauline, not to be outdone, nodded as well. It is so. They want to stay here and play with us. Okay, girls. Sit down, and I'll get your snack. Doris put a plate of cookies in front of each of the girls, along with a glass of milk. Would you like anything else, Miss Hughes? No, thank you. Miss Hughes watched as Gretchen kept sewing away at a dress. She looked around and spotted another small dress that was half sewn. May I be of help? She picked up the small dress and took the needle that was hanging from it. I've always enjoyed sewing. While the twins ate their snack and the boys played outside, Doris fixed supper and Gretchen and Miss Hughes sewed. I don't remember meeting you before, Miss Hughes said to Gretchen. Have you lived in Salmon Long? All my life. Gretchen frowned. You don't go to church here in town, do you? Miss Hughes shook her head. I usually go home on the weekends. My family lives about twenty miles away. It's a long drive, but it's worth it to be with people who love me. Maybe if you stayed here on the weekends, you would meet some more people, Doris suggested. I really haven't found the community to be very welcoming. I know it's sad, but it's a true fact. Most of the mothers of the students I teach seem to resent me for some reason. I don't resent you at all, Doris said. If you want to stay this weekend, I promise that you'll have two friends. Miss Hughes seemed to think about it for a moment, before slowly shaking her head. Not this weekend, but maybe soon. She looked over at Gretchen. What does your husband do? Gretchen frowned for a moment, seeming to have an inner debate. I've never been married. My fiancé died at sea. I see. Miss Hughes took a moment to process the information that she'd been given. 
I suppose you're having a hard time here in town too, aren't you? Oh, yes. But it's my home. I don't know where else I'd go. Gretchen looked down at the dress she was sewing for a moment. Doris has been the first to offer me a hand of friendship in about six months. Allow me to be the second then. Doris and I are outsiders because we're not from here, but you're an outsider because of circumstance. Yes. We were to be married less than a week after he died. I found out a month later that I was expecting. Gretchen smiled sadly. Thank you for accepting me as I am, Miss Hughes. Please, call me by my Christian name. It's Rika. Rika? Doris asked. That's unusual. I like it. It's short for Frederica. And so much nicer than being called Freddy all the time. I would say so. Gretchen said. Well, I'm glad we're friends, Rika. Me too. Doris grinned at them both. And now I can tell the boys that if they misbehave at school, they'll upset my friend. I really don't think they'll be pleased with me starting a friendship with their teacher. Rika smiled. Maybe your mother should have tried that. Doris giggled. My mother never much cared what mischief we got up to. She thought children should be allowed to run free and get into trouble at will. So we did. She turned from where she was peeling potatoes at the sink. My sister watched us when I was about seven, and my brother and I decided to paint the cow. We put her on newspaper before we did it. I'm still not sure why we were worried about the barn floor as we painted the cow. Rika shook her head. I think I would have quit if I was your teacher. How many children are in your family? Fourteen. Oh, just shoot me. I wouldn't have made it through a whole semester. Rika seemed horrified at the mere prospect. Many teachers didn't. My younger brothers and sisters are still causing problems today. The locals referred to us as the demon horde. Rika frowned at her. That's as bad as the butler brats. The boys hate that name. Me too. Pre said. I'm not a brat. I know you're not, baby, Dora said to the girl. We're trying to turn their reputation around. Hopefully it will work. She knew that she had never been able to rise above the demon horde though. Hopefully the people in this town were less judgmental than they'd been back in Massachusetts, but so far, it certainly didn't seem so. The boys rushed into the house then, stopping short when they saw their teacher sitting at the table. Are you staying for supper, Miss Hughes? Bobby finally asked. Yes, I am. Would that be all right with you? Bobby shrugged. Now that I don't get in trouble at school, I guess it's all right. Matthew stared at Miss Hughes. I think so. Go wash up for supper, boys. Doris instructed. Make sure your papa remembers that it'll be supper time in twenty minutes as well. I don't want him to be late, since we have guests tonight. Guests? Gretchen asked. Am I staying too? I certainly hope so. Doris answered, a smile on her face. Will your parents mind? I told them I might stay tonight. I wasn't sure. I'm still not. What are you making? Gretchen's eyes twinkled with laughter as she asked. Because you're only staying if it's something you like? Doris asked. Of course. I'm expecting, after all. Rika laughed. You'd better make the most of that excuse while you can. You won't be expecting for much longer. No, I guess I won't. Gretchen patted her belly. I want to get this dress done before supper. I only have to finish the hem. Do you come here every day? Rika asked. Gretchen nodded. This is my third day in a row. Dora said I'm welcome any time. I'm sewing for my supper though. I think that's very nice. I may join you both some afternoons. Not for supper, but for the company. Doris nodded. 
We'd love that. I'm so glad I found such nice ladies here. After my first couple of days, I was sure I wouldn't have any friends at all. I was even missing my sisters in the demon horde. Well, we can't have you missing them. Rika said with a laugh. The boys came back a short while later with their father in tow. He nodded at Miss Hughes, before kissing his wife quickly. What's for supper? He didn't understand the laughter that came from his casual question, but he didn't ask either. His house seemed to be full of women every time he came home, and he wasn't sure how he felt about that. At least they were all pleasant women. When everyone was seated, Dora served their supper, stew, and he prayed for them. He was surprised at the lively chatter around the table. It was as if the three women had known one another for years. While he was pleased that his wife was friending people others didn't, he was surprised by it. The boys were understandably quiet as they tried to get used to their teacher chatting away happily at the table. Doris noticed that Rika's hair was even escaping the bun. It was a mess of dark, curly tendrils. Doris thought her friend might be quite beautiful with her hair down. After supper, the three women did the dishes together. One cleared the table, one washed, and one wiped the dishes. When he saw how effortlessly they worked together, Harvey left the room, uncomfortable in his own home. How was it that women who had never eaten a meal together, before, could just jump up and work together so quickly? He stayed in the parlor with the children, reading them a chapter of the book Doris had been reading to them every night. It was a book she'd brought with her entitled Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. He'd never heard of it, let alone read it, but the children seemed to enjoy it a great deal. As he was finishing the chapter, he heard the door close. Doris came and stood, looking at him from the doorway. She had a soft look on her face. He put a piece of paper in the book to mark his place before closing it. It's time for bed. Everyone use the water closet, and then up we go. He was amazed that the twins were already trained. He hadn't had time to work with them at all, and it took her less than a week. He glanced at Doris. Are you coming up with us? She nodded. Bedtime is one of my favorite times of day. After kissing all four of the children goodnight, they went back downstairs together, sitting close to one another on the sofa. So how did you become best friends with the boys' teacher? Rika? She's very sweet. I think the three of us mainly bonded over the fact that we're all outsiders here. She's never been included in anything in town, because she's not from here. I'm treated strangely, in part because I'm not from here, but mostly because the boys have an interesting reputation. And Gretchen is out of favor, because she's pregnant and her fiancé died. So the three outcasts are becoming friends with each other? Is that due to really liking each other, or desperation? Doris shrugged. I don't know about the others but I genuinely like them both. They're kind and non-judgmental. That's all I need in a friend. I'm glad you found them then. You're settling in nicely. I am. I didn't think I would at first. Everyone treated me badly for the first day or two. I think I knew I belonged the moment I met Gretchen. Harvey traced her cheek with the back of one of his fingers. I wish you'd known the moment you met me, but I guess I understand. Oh, I knew I wanted to belong the moment I met you. Your big brown eyes make me think of chocolate. I could lose myself in them. Is that so? He leaned forward and stopped any answer she may have made with his lips. Are you ready to have a real marriage yet, wife? You know what? I think I am. Dora surprised even herself by getting to her feet and holding her hand out for him. She pulled him toward the bedroom they shared and shut the door firmly. Chapter 9 Dora started having both of her new friends over most afternoons. At first having Rika there was intimidating for Bobby and Matthew, but after a while, they realized she was going to be around fairly often, and they stopped worrying about it so much. It was during their second week of meeting every day, 
while Rika was stitching madly on a new dress for little Pri, that there was a knock on the door. Gretchen was taking a quick break, because the baby wouldn't stop kicking. When Doris opened the door, she stood face to face with someone she'd never seen before. May I help you? The older woman on the other side of the door nodded, looking a bit angry. Are you Doris Butler? Yes, I am. Doris was certain she'd never seen the other woman before, but she obviously knew who Doris was. I'm Janice Linden. The women of town decided together that we were shunning one of the friends you are harboring here. She's not to be spoken to. Doris blinked at the other woman a couple of times. I will speak with whomever I please. I'm sorry if you don't approve, but both women here are my friends. Is there anything else I can help you with? She stayed as calm as she could, but she wanted to hurt the older woman. And her brothers had taught her to fight dirty. You'd allow yourself to be an outcast with her? You wouldn't mind if your family became outcasts as well? Are you telling me if I keep talking to my friend, someone whom I think of as a sister, you would stop people in town from talking to me? And my husband and children? Janice crossed her arms over her chest. That's exactly what I'm saying. You're being ridiculous. You have no right to tell anyone who they may or may not talk to. Do you think that's Christian behavior or something? I assure you, it's not. The older woman gasped, obviously shocked someone was standing up to her. You dare say this to me? Dora shrugged one shoulder. I really don't care if you shun me. I have two good friends whom I love. I have a husband and children I adore. I don't need you. Before the other woman could say a word, Dora shut the door in the horrible woman's face, before turning to her friends. Do you believe that woman? Gretchen stared at her friend for a moment, before bursting into laughter. You've just signed your own social death warrant in this town. Mrs. Linden would have been my mother-in-law. And she's the one who shunned you? That old biddy. I have half a mind to chase her down and tell her exactly what I think of her. Gretchen shook her head. Don't do it, Doris. She's truly not worth it. Let her do what she will. We have each other. Doris huffed out a breath and sat down heavily in a chair. She looked over at Rika. What are we going to do about this? Rika shrugged. I'm pretty much shunned as well. Do people talk to you? Doris thought about it for a moment. Not usually, now that I think about it. Mrs. Gottweiler talks to me when I go to the store for supplies. The pastor's wife nods at me and tells me she's praying for me every time she sees me. Other than that, no one speaks to me at all. How's it going to hurt you then? I guess it won't. Not that I'm worried about me. I can't believe they shunned our dear, sweet Gretchen. Gretchen laughed. They shunned me a long time ago. I'm not at all worried about it. You do realize that the two of you have changed my entire life? You talk to me every day, and you don't judge me for getting myself in trouble. I'm happy. Well, if you're happy, then I'm happy. Doris crossed her arms over her chest. I can't imagine this is going to change our lives at all. Gretchen bit her lip, thinking about the situation. I wouldn't count on that. Watch yourself, my friend. Asterisk. That Sunday at church, Rika sat on one side of Gretchen, Doris on the other. Rika and Doris each held one of the twins. Gretchen offered, but Pre complained there wasn't enough room on her lap because her baby was using it all up. After the sermon, Doris glanced around the church, noting that not one woman in the congregation was even looking at her or her friends. They're all doing exactly what Mrs. Linden says, aren't they? She asked Gretchen, slightly awed at the power the woman wielded over the others in town. Yes. They always do. I'm not sure why, but they've always done whatever she wants them to do. At first, when news got out about my pregnancy, people were at least friendly still. But after she told them all to shun me, not a single woman would speak to me, 
except my mother, and she really only says horrible things. I hate it, but I have nowhere to go, so I endure. Gretchen patted her belly, looking straight at Mrs. Linden, the child's grandmother. I love this child, though, so what am I supposed to do? She's an evil, spiteful, old harridan. I don't care what people say and think. You're my friend and always will be. As Dora sat there with her friend, Harve talked to the men of the church while the boys raced around the pews with some friends from school. One by one the mothers snatched up their boys and told them they weren't allowed to play with those awful butler brats. As Doris watched, she became angrier and angrier. The boys weren't brats. They had learned to sit as quietly as boys their ages could be expected to sit through church. No, they weren't perfect, but they were much better behaved than they'd been when she'd arrived in town just weeks before. After lunch, Harve asked Doris what was happening. I know most of the mothers in town don't care for my boys, but they've never been so downright rude before. Do you have any idea what's wrong with them? Doris sighed. Mrs. Linden came over the other day. She told me that she and the other ladies in town had shunned Gretchen, and unless I did the same, my family and I would be shunned as well. She said what? He stared at her in disbelief. The women in town can't just choose to shun someone. That's a matter for the church to decide. Not the women. Do you think I don't know this? I told her that very thing, and I slammed the door right in her face. Then I sat down with my shunned friend and our other friend, who hasn't been shunned but no one talks to anyway, and we all had a nice time together. He ran his hands through his hair. I'm going to talk to the pastor. She sighed. Not yet. Give me a little more time. It's already affecting the boys. I can't let that continue. Rika told me the boys have as many friends as they ever did. If that changes at school this week, she's going to let me know. We've talked about it. He looked skeptical, but finally he nodded. All right. I just don't want them to be hurt by this. I won't allow that to happen. If the boys start being shunned, we'll go to the pastor. Harve didn't like the situation one bit, but so far, she seemed to have navigated the tricky waters of salmon very well. He could only assume that would continue. Asterisk. Before Gretchen arrived on Monday morning, Dora set out for the general store. She needed to get some fabric so she could start sewing some new clothes for Harve. Finally, they'd made enough new things for the children, and it was time for her to put her needle to work on shirts for her husband. Without her friend's help, she knew she wouldn't have even touched the surface of the work she had ahead of her. She walked into the store, leaving both twins on the bench out front where she could see them. She smiled at Mrs. Gottweiler and headed to the back of the store where the yard goods were. She turned when Mrs. Gottweiler tapped her on the shoulder. The older woman's face was sad as she said, I can't let you shop here. Doris frowned. I can't shop here? This is the only store in town. Where do you expect me to shop? Mrs. Gottweiler wrung her hands together in front of her. Doris, you've always been kind to me. You're careful to make sure the girls don't touch anything they oughtn't, and you ask about my grandbabies. But you've made Mrs. Linden angry and she's told all of us that we have to shun you. Doris tilted her head to one side, thinking about the situation. And you're just going to obey her? You know that's not how a shunning works. You don't just stop talking to people, because someone tells you to. What would Pastor Savoy say? I don't know. I do know that Mrs. Savoy has said she's obeying the shunning. Why does everyone follow Mrs. Linden and her silly edicts? She's not even a nice person. Mrs. Gottweiler frowned. Don't say that. What if someone hears you? What would happen if someone heard me? Does she have spies? An army that will hurry out and shoot me? What can she do? I don't know, but it will be something. I don't want to be shunned. Doris sighed. 
Mrs. Gottweiler, I promise you this right now. If Mrs. Linden tells the others to shun you, you'll have three friends. Me, Gretchen, and Rika. We will be by your side. And I can also promise you that we'll be much better friends than Mrs. Linden has ever dreamed of being. She's a mean, spiteful woman. We're kind, caring people. Why would you choose to be her friend when you can be ours? Mrs. Gottweiler studied her for a moment. Does that offer include the other women in town? Dora shrugged. If they want to continue to speak to us, we'll be happy to call them friends. All of them. Some of them. I think all the ladies in town need to stand up to that woman. I don't know why people give her the power they do. Give her the power? She demands it. So? If people stop listening to and obeying her demands, she will lose all that power. Trust me on this. I will be a better friend than she could ever dream of being. After a moment of consideration, the older woman nodded. I will continue to be your friend, and you may shop here. Doris realized, then, that Mrs. Gottweiler would be a good ally. Everyone in town had to shop at the store. Why not let her spread the word that they weren't going to kowtow to Mrs. Linden's demands for another minute? Spread the word that there's a mutiny in town, and Mrs. Linden is no longer the dictator. A slow smile spread across Mrs. Gottweiler's face. I will do just that. Should I send them to you if they want more instructions about the uprising? Dora shook her head with a laugh. Uprising? Is that what we're calling it? I think it is. Do you prefer the word coup? I think I do. We'll call it the courageous coup. Tell all the women that if they have courage to join us in our fight against tyranny. Mrs. Gottweiler nodded with a grin. I'm going to do just that. I wish I had a flyer I could hand out to send people to your house for a secret meeting of some sort. Dora sighed. There's nothing secret about what we're doing. We're taking the town back from that crazy old woman. No more bowing to her demands. No more acting like she's the queen of us all. We're in America, and everyone is equal here, whether Mrs. Linden likes it or not. Chapter 10 When Doris got back to her house after shopping, she found Gretchen waiting for her. Good morning. Gretchen looked up from where she'd been staring at the group. Good morning. Did you enjoy your shopping excursion? I did, but it was very unusual. Doris briefly explained what Mrs. Gottweiler had said to her. She's going to recruit people to join our rebellion against Mrs. Linden's rule. Gretchen put her hand over her mouth, staring at Doris in shock. You have no idea what that woman is capable of. I know that if she's no longer backed by all the women in town, she won't have as much power. The less power she has, the more we have. It'll work, or it won't. Let's see what happens. Gretchen was obviously skeptical as she followed Doris and the twins inside. We're starting shirts for Harv today. I have an old one torn up to use as a pattern. Do you mind cutting the fabric and getting started while I bake bread? Not at all. Gretchen was always willing to do whatever her friend asked. She enjoyed the meal she cooked, but more than that, she enjoyed their camaraderie and friendship. As they worked, the twins played, with both women keeping half an eye on them, and together, that made a whole eye. Not too terribly bad. The women started coming to the door at just past ten. Doris hurried to answer the first knock, having no idea who it could be. Mrs. Jensen. Doris couldn't imagine why the woman was there. She'd talked to her a few times at church, but she wouldn't have said they became friends. I'm here to join the rebellion. Mrs. Jensen, the mother of one of the boy's friends from school, didn't wait for an invitation. Instead, she walked right in and plopped herself down in a kitchen chair. What's our plan of action? Doris and Gretchen exchanged looks. We don't really have a plan of action. We just want the women in town to stop listening to everything Mrs. Linden says, 
Doris responded as she pulled a loaf of bread from the oven. Would you like to stay for lunch? Mrs. Jensen nodded. That would be wonderful. I haven't had lunch with a friend in ages. Why not? Doris asked, truly confused about how these women lived their lives. I don't know. I tried to visit other women when I first came to town, but Mrs. Linden told me that my place was in my home, cooking and cleaning. How many hours a day does she think it takes to take care of my husband and my son, who is in school most of the day? I spend a lot of hours sitting around doing nothing. I'm surprised you didn't volunteer to cook for my family before my arrival then. I did. Mrs. Jensen protested. Many times. Mrs. Linden kept telling me the schedule was full, and I wasn't needed. Doris frowned. Much more help was needed. My mother was told the same thing, Gretchen said softly. Mrs. Linden was in charge of scheduling help, you see. That's sad. By lunchtime, there were four more ladies in Doris's kitchen, each of them with a similar story. Doris cooked a huge pot of soup and gave some to each of the ladies, along with some dinner rolls she made. It wasn't a perfect meal, but at least it was filling. As they ate, Doris thought about their plan of attack. Are all of you ladies willing to continue talking to my friends and me? To bulk Mrs. Linden? There were four nods in response. I'll do it, but it scares me, Mrs. Jensen responded. There's safety in numbers. You were safe acting rudely when you were part of Mrs. Linden's horde. Now you're part of my circle of friends. And we're growing by the minute. As more and more women filled her kitchen throughout the day, Doris realized she wasn't the only woman who was unhappy with the way things were in Salmon, Oregon. When school let out, more than half of the mothers who had school-aged children were gathered in her home. All of them agreed to stand up to Mrs. Linden and support Gretchen. When they boys came into the house, they stopped short, surprised at all of the people sitting there. Doris acted like nothing was out of the usual. Do you want your snacks? Bobby nodded, his brow furrowed. There are a lot of moms here. There are. Did the other kids play with you at school today? Doris had to ask. She needed to know that her actions weren't affecting her boys. Matthew shrugged. As many as usual. It was a good day. I think Miss Hughes is coming to see us again tonight. Oh, good. I was worried about that. Doris put cookies on a plate and then poured two glasses of milk, sending the boys into the parlor. She didn't normally let them eat there, but there was no room at all around her kitchen table. Mrs. Smith looked at Doris, as if she had every answer. What are we going to do when Mrs. Linden comes here? Do you think she will? Doris asked. She hadn't considered that possibility. Of course, she will. She knows you're at the heart of the rebellion. Gretchen nibbled on a cookie, watching her friend. I guess we'll all stand up to her together. Remember, there's safety in numbers. Doris had a hard time believing so many women had allowed themselves to be bullied and controlled when they could have made a stand together years before. There was a knock at the door, then that was more like a pounding. Someone was angry and wanted in. Gretchen answered, because she was closest to the door, and Mrs. Linden flew into the house, already yelling. All of you women need to go home. These women have been shunned. Mrs. Jensen stood up, surprising Doris. You have no authority to shun anyone. You're not in control of this town. Mrs. Linden looked as if she was going to hit Mrs. Jensen for a moment. Is that how all of you feel? The women all stood, nodding. Doris took a step forward. We're united in not letting you control or bully us any longer, Mrs. Linden. Thank you for stopping by so we could all tell you. I'm shunning every one of you. Doris simply laughed. What you don't understand is shunning doesn't hurt if you have a good friend by your side. Gretchen and Rika have become like sisters to me. As long as they're still talking to me, nothing you do can bother me. 
The look of hate in Mrs. Linden's eyes was almost frightening. You'll regret this. Dora shrugged. Maybe I will. Right now, I'm happy for the whole town that your power has been broken. She saw her husband standing behind the mean woman, a bit embarrassed about her behavior, but she refused to back down. Harvey stepped into the kitchen. Mrs. Linden, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave. We have nothing to say to you any longer. I'll be speaking to the pastor about the way you've treated the women of this town. Mrs. Linden's face turned a deep shade of red. You will rue the day you said that to me. She rushed out of the house, hurrying out of town. Doris shook her head. No one says rue the day anymore. She needs to learn what century we live in. The kitchen quickly emptied after that. Even Gretchen went to check on the children in the parlor. What made you come home in the middle of the day? Doris asked. Harf shrugged. I saw many of the ladies come here today, and then I saw Mrs. Linden. I was worried they'd gathered together to bully you and Gretchen. I guess not. Doris grinned. I talked to Mrs. Gottweiler about the situation this morning, after she told me I was no longer welcome in the mercantile. She quickly related the events of the day. So by the time Mrs. Linden came, my kitchen was full of women who were willing to stand up to her. He smiled, reaching out to caress her cheek. You are amazing. You've calmed the boys. You've trained the girls. You've made friends with the friendless. And me, what you've done to me, is just amazing. She took a step forward into his arms. And what exactly have I done to you? You've made me the happiest man alive. You've made me realize that even though I lost my first love, I have another love that's just as strong. You've made my boys happy. She looked up at him, her eyes meeting his. Was he giving her the words she needed to hear so badly? What exactly are you saying, Harf? I'm saying I love you. I love you with everything inside me. I love you because you've changed my life. I love you because you've changed my children's lives. But most importantly, I love you because you're you. Who would have thought one of the demon horde could tame the butler brats so thoroughly? Doris grinned. I love you right back, Harvey Butler. Thank you for inviting me into your life. Thank you for changing my world. He dropped a kiss on her lips. Now if we could just figure out what to do for your salmon sisters. She grinned. You mean Rika and Gretchen? Yes. They need their happily ever afters too, don't they? They do. And I think I'm going to help them find them.